We welcome all of you tonight. We're going to commence the 28th chapter of Genesis tonight. This will be our 46th installment <coughs> in this series. We're going to be reviewing verses uh, 1 through 9. I've emphasized this uh, through this book and repeatedly that I don't want to hasten through, the, through it because this is a book of beginnings, things that happened first, first time never happened here. I didn't list them for you in this one here, I just list them once in a while, but we're right at 300 that I got thus far up to the 28th chapter. But the purpose of Genesis is to introduce us to God, number one, and to his nature. You'd be surprised how few people know what God's really like. And then he, he has a purpose. And when God has a purpose, there's nothing that can stop it. Amen. We're learning that God picks people out. And you can't explain on an earthly level why he did. And we're learning that whatever God starts, he finishes. And that God's tendency in earth is to work in, under impossible circumstances. I'll read the text and then we'll proceed. You remember that Jacob has gone into Isaac disguised as Esau. He got the blessing. And now I took the position, and I'm dogmatic about this, that that's the way God fulfilled his purpose. That yeah. God orchestrated that whole thing. Amen. And then we showed in Scripture how that God has done this, worked like this before. That's the God's manner. So this is not, this incident of Jacob getting the blessing isn't that this man goofed it up and it worked, turned out like this, but God just made it turn out right. That's not it at all. Yeah. This is not how God works. I want to be emphatic about it. Yeah. When God has a purpose, he's the one that fulfills it. Yeah. Now he's, uh, we start with, Isaac discovered he, he blessed the wrong one, and he trembled. He trembled when he found out. I mean, that's how people that have faith in God, if they think they made a blunder, oh, <laughs> it's a shake-up time. He trembled. His mother knew it was told that Esau said he's going to kill Jacob as soon as this thing kind of cooled down. He's going to kill Jacob. Rebecca tells Jacob this and says, you get right now, you head off to my brother's house in Mesopotamia. And now Isaac's going to take over from there. Isaac knows about this and we're going to begin with there. Isaac called Jacob and, and blessed him. <laughs> this is the one that deceived him. Uh -huh. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Uh -huh and charged him and said, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham. Give the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed after thee, that thou mayest inherit the land, wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. And Isaac went away, and Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Jacob said Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob, and sent him away to Padanaram, 
to take a wife from thence, and that he had blessed him, he gave him charge. He blessed him. He gave him charge, saying, "Thou shalt not take a wife of the of the daughters of Canaan." And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Padanaram. Esau, seeing that his daughters of Can the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael. And took unto the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabajoth, to be his wife. <laughs> now we are being introduced at this point in Genesis to the concept of obedience. Now, there's not a lot said about obedience prior to Abraham. There's just like you got Noah, Noah, and Noah. That's about it. So this concept of obedience is being developed. The first use of the word obey is in reference to Abraham. It's the first time the word obey is in the Bible. Genesis 22, 18, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed. The first time God, the first time God ever said that word, so far as the revelation is concerned, obeyed. Now we're 2,000 years into human history at this point. So if you think sin didn't do a number on the human race, you better be thinking again. Sin made the human race obtuse, dull, dead toward God, and God's got to like send him to school tutored them in these things. God also said to Isaac, obedience, remember being introduced to obedience, because the day of salvation is a day of obedience. God doesn't have disobedient children, not in Christ. Amen. Amen. You go to hell for being disobedient. I'm sorry, that's what the scripture says. Those that obey not, that, that's what it says. The church today is used to disobedience, see, but I yeah, you better not be. God said to Isaac, I'll make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. Anytime I told Abraham to do something, he did it. And that's why I'm blessing you, Isaac. What does it mean to obey? It's just interesting. To, what does that mean? Well, the English word uh, means to follow the commands or guidance. But pretty much kindergarten stuff. I understand that. Submit to authority. Carry out an order. But I want to take a moment here and, and define it, give it a little further definition what it means to obey. Because I really don't think most professing Christians have a clear idea of what obedience is. I think they're thinking in terms of mechanical type responses to God. But here's several things that obedience involves. First, it's, it involves intelligent hearing. Mm -hmm. You don't obey something you didn't hear mm -hmm. from God. Obedience is constrained by what I call heart intelligence. It's a different kind of intelligence. It's not natural. It's not intelligence like Adam had. Mm -hmm. That's not that kind of intelligence. In other words, intelligent hearing is you're able to process what you heard. Mm -hmm. Obedience involves uh, attention. Mm -hmm. The person who obeys has fastened his attention on who's speaking and he's paying attention to what the person says. All of their voices recede into the background. Mm -hmm. It involves putting things together. The person who obeys has associated what God said with himself. Yeah, amen. He's able to make that connection and respond accordingly. Obedience revolves consenting, agreeing with what's been said. Yeah, mm -hmm. A person who disagrees with God can't obey God. Yeah. Even they may go through the mechanics. I understand they may go through the mechanics, but they can't obey God mm -hmm. if they don't consent to what he said. Discernment is another thing about obedience. The person who obeys understands what's been said, and so he knows what to do. And it involves listening. That's extended hearing. That's a focused hearing. Amen. You don't quit paying attention until the talking's done. One example, Saul of Tarsus listened to what Jesus said. He heard him out. 
Then when he finished, he said, well, all right, what do you want me to do now? See? Uh -huh. Some people would have just cut it short. They'd have just walked off. Yeah. It, it involves regarding, with high regard for the person who, who you're obeying. It's a necessary high regard for him. And doing what was commanded. If God says such a thing as dip, in the river Jordan seven times. He doesn't give you any reason now. Yeah, dip seven times. Obedient person dips seven times. Mm -hmm. Not six, not ten. It involves being guided. Person who's obedient forfeits their self-will yeah. and submits to the will of God. Amen. And they conduct their conduct around what God said. They actually shape their life around what God said. The whole life changes. After Jesus appeared to Saul, he was never the same. He didn't live the same. He didn't talk the same. He didn't act the same. He never again the rest of his life ever persecuted another Christian. He changed. Conformed his life. We'll find it, that's exactly what Abraham did. Every time God, every time, every time God appeared to Abraham and told him to do something, Abraham built his life around that. Amen. Amen. No exceptions. <laughs> and of course there's compliance, conformity. You, you, you match your life with what, what's been said. Now I come from a background where there's a lot of emphasis was placed on baptism. But there was not a lot of emphasis placed on conforming your life to Christ. So consequently, you had no way, if you just looked at a person, you had no way of telling whether they'd been baptized or not. Most of the people, that's the way it was. That's not obedience. Listen, a person who goes through the mechanics of baptism and they don't walk in newness of life, they were not baptized. They were just dunked, that's all. And submission, of course. And all this was lived out, this kind of obedience, was all lived out prior to the giving of the law, prior to Jesus taking away all sins. You've got to see how remarkable this is now. The potency of faith was confirmed in the lives of these few men. How very little. You could put everything revealed to Abraham in a three by five card and have a little room left for comments. And yet he had the kind of faith we have to have. We have to have the faith of Abraham. Faith is potent. Yeah. Enough's not been made of it. <laughs> it's unconscionable that people professing Christ should be fundamentally disobedient yeah. mm -hmm. and unbelieving. Yeah. This cannot be defended. And I object to people trying to do it. Yeah trying to explain why people do this. God is greatly to be praised. The records of these men and women are here. They teach us faith does work. If you believe God, if you believe God, the rest will begin to happen. Amen. So Isaac called Jacob. He called. He called Jacob. Well, it's just another thing we're being introduced into in Scripture is this thing of being called. Not not arrested <laughs> or thumped on the head or chained up and put in prison called, called Pharaoh called Abraham Abimelech called Abraham angel of the Lord called Abraham the Lord called unto Abraham Abimelech from Syria called unto Ab Isaac Isaac called Esau I won't read all these, there's a lot of them Calling. If you're looking for something like a miracle to happen before your eyes to kind of wake up, you're making a big mistake. That's not the way God works. I mean, He worked, think what He worked at Sinai. Well, I tell you, He had the people's attention at Sinai. Nobody believed. Didn't change a single living soul. It took a little over a month. They're back worshiping an idol. God apprehends people by calling. Of course, I admit you had to be sensitive <laughs> to the call. Sometimes God has called you and maybe you thought it was something else. 
But if you look into it, you think, oh, that was God. He may open the mouth of a jackass. Sometimes you would be working with some person, not even a godly person, but a fool. God uses that person to call you to something you should be more aware of. Calling, calling. It's important to get a hold of this calling. This is how God involves people in his will. He does it by calling. And now he so he introduces a history of people that were called and you kind of see see how it works. Now God can make you do something. He can make you eat grass. Lose your mind and eat grass for seven years. He can make <laughs> He doesn't have to have your permission to do that. He can do that. We, we, don't, we don't advise this. Yeah, yeah. And he can apprehend Saul of Tarsus mm -hmm. on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what Paul said he did. He apprehended him. got him by the nap of the neck. Boy, that was it. Mm -hmm. But it didn't end there. It didn't end until Saul said, what would you have me do? Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? Then... Then he kind of entered into it, but that was that was a very strong call. Now this is quite different calling from an appeal to emotion or entertainment, drawing people by entertainment, this kind of thing. It's quite a bit different than that, but this has been popular in our day to, to get people's attention by doing something they really like. Maybe you say, we don't want to sing the world's songs, but, but we'll use their tunes. We'll put some Christian words to them. That's it. And we'll appeal to them that this isn't how God works, brethren. Mm -hmm. Amen. He didn't speak to anybody in the Egyptian tongue. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. He called Paul, he taught, he taught him in a Hebrew tongue. That's what the scripture says. He doesn't appeal. He doesn't appeal to anything that men like. He doesn't appeal to that at all. See, the purpose of God is to get you to like what he likes. Why, why would he appeal to what you like? To get your attention. Well, so much for the health and wealth. <laughs> so he was saying, God will give you a lot of money. But listen, God said if you love money, and it says it's going to be awful hard to enter in the kingdom of God. If you have a lot of money, it's going to be, going to be like a camel going through the eye of a needle. See, God doesn't call people by that, that way. Now, I'll tell you right now, <clears throat> there are a few things that have been more damaging to the church than a lack of spiritual sensitivity. Yeah. Amen. You know, there are churches that if the Apostle Paul was speaking and it got 1130, that he'd have to stop. Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't continue on to break a day unless he raised a bunch of the dead like he did there. Troas. See this? The point I'm bringing out is God is introducing us to the divine mode of dealing with people and it's just simply it's not like it's done today. It's not that way. It's not feed the multitudes then preach to them. <clears throat> Jesus preached to them then fed them. Yeah. It's just the other way around. And then they followed him for three days without eating. So, if Someone says, will you give us some food? They say, well, you got to kind of pay attention for three days to yeah. preach and then we... Why they go away? They called, called Jacob, and Jacob came, of course. And then it says he blessed him. This is the third time the scriptures have said Isaac blessed Jacob. This is the third time. First was Genesis twenty-seven twenty-three. He blessed him. Genesis twenty-seven twenty-seven. He blessed him. And this text here, he blessed him so three times. I like that, that, that idea of multiple blessing. Yeah. I like that, I like that. See, you should expect this when you get involved in uh, things of God and with God himself and the purpose of God. Blessings, we, we use it in the plural. Yeah. Spiritual blessings. I gather that with each blessing it was like an enlarged. Mm -hmm. When blessed Isaac enlarged. Jacob enlarged. I got to have a clumsy picture there of a threefold cord. It's not easily broken. Mm -hmm. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of history, brethren, from the deliverance of Israel from Egypt to not throwing them overboard when they were falling away in the wilderness 
all trace back to these three men. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God constructed these men in such a way as he could bless future generations because of them. Amen. And he's acquainting us with this idea. God can bless people because of somebody else. Amen. Well, you see how he's setting this up for yeah, the yeah. coming Savior. <laughs> now this blessing... That, Jacob, that Isaac gave Jacob, it wasn't independent of the Abrahamic blessing. Mm -hmm. It was passing that blessing on. Now, this, this is very unusual, see. Uh, this doesn't happen today. Another person being blessed with the same blessing, the blessings given to Abraham, then he took the blessings given to Abraham, and he gives it to Isaac, then Isaac, the blessing given to Abraham, he gives it to Jacob. Well, that's... Uh, that's a good thing to think about. Yes, amen. Now I want to I want to comment briefly on what kind of blessing this was. It wasn't the kind of blessing you receive in Christ. Uh -huh. It's narrowed down to this: the land of Canaan. Uh -huh. They were promised the land of Canaan. They were promised the privilege of being the people of God. They were promised of the raising up of a Savior. That kind of that kind of summarizes the Abrahamic blessing. That summarizes what it is. It all had to do with the coming of Christ, with the preparation of a land in which Jesus could be born, of our preparation of people that were schooled in the things of God so Jesus could be raised up in a scripturally literate society. Jesus couldn't have been raised in Rome or Alexandria. He had to be raised someplace where there was a spiritual culture. Admittedly, the people hadn't taken full advantage of it, but Jesus could take advantage of it. Amen. He could go to the temple. He could take advantage of these people. Mm -hmm. That's why That's why all these blessings about the people and the land, that's why all that's there. Now, after Jesus, we experienced some of this blessing. I want you to note how specific... God is when he traces it back to Abraham and his seed. In Abraham's seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. It's Abraham's seed. Genesis 26, 4. In Isaac's seed, all the nations of the earth be blessed. In Jacob's seed, all the families of the earth be blessed. My point, what I'm underscoring here is that this, this was all in anticipation of the coming Christ. Jesus' genealogy will be declared to be back to Abraham. Luke traces it all the way back to Adam. But the key genealogy was Abraham. He would come from the lineage of Jesse, Isaiah 11.1, 1, who, was, who was from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's lineage. He would be a descendant of David, which was from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's lineage. He would be given the throne of David, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's lineage. A son and a child is promised to Israel, who were the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He'd be born in the promised land because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, see? Mm -hmm. He'd be born, uh, he'd be, have a ministry in Canaan. What I'm pointing out is this all was about the coming Messiah. It just wasn't about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Jews, although that's all God told him about. Mm -hmm. He just hinted at the coming Messiah. He says, Who thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, but he never told them who the seed was or any, any extensive teaching about it at all. The, uh, Isaiah said, and Paul confirmed, the deliverer would come out of Zion. He'd come from the Jews. Mm -hmm. The Savior of the world would come from the Jews. So God's developing this, yeah. this nation. All these prophecies presume the nation of Israel being located in Canaan and the land being sanctified to the Lord. Yeah, that's, what, that's what God's preparing the people for here. Isaac calls Jacob, but he charged him. Didn't suggest. This is not a suggestion. Mm -hmm. This is a charge. See, when God calls people to himself his in, and reveals his intentions to them, it has a life altering impact on the person who sees it. 
Take, for instance, Noah. After God called him, he was never the same. That's right. He changed what he did. He changed how he lived. He just he could be given a 120-year project to complete. His whole life centered in that call that he received. Abraham, when Abraham was called, he was never the same. He never did one other thing that wasn't connected with God. Even when they had Ishmael, he thought they thought they were fulfilling the promise of God. It wasn't like lust or something like that that drove that. Their whole life was governed by what God said. He lived in a different place and acted in a different manner. Isaac was the same way. As soon as he became involved in the call of God, he never did leave Canaan. Mm -hmm. He never did leave. Mm -hmm. Abraham never left. Was he located? Never left. He stayed there. Yeah. Jacob left to go down into Egypt, mm -hmm. which was an incubator in which the nation of Israel was developed. Mm -hmm. And he's and then but when he was buried, he took him back into Canaan. Mm -hmm. See, none of these men. When God called them, were champions of free will. Yeah, that's right. Or independent planning of their lives. They, mm -hmm. they weren't these kind of people. Everyone's got his rights. It's my life. None of them. This is not how any of them reason. When God called them, they said, we're going to, whatever God says, that's what we're going to do. Amen. In all of this, God was confirming that what he starts must be completed by him. And in order to be completed by him, he's got to be involved in every itty-bitty detail of it. Amen. Not going to leave it to mankind anything. Now, it's a, it's a sin of unspeakable magnitude for people to, like, plan out their own lives independently of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, people may tend to overlook it. You know, say, well, they're my, they're my children, you know. But what, so what? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not right. Mm -hmm. And it's just good to say it. At any rate, say it. Maybe God work, work through it. Amen. <laughs> so he charged him. Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Mm -hmm. I want to again stress this was a commandment. Mm -hmm. Don't take a daughter, a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Now, two things are involved here. One was a, there'd be a woman that lived in Canaan, a Canaanite, mm -hmm. Canaanite-ish woman. But there's something more involved here than that. And some of the versions of Scripture reflect this by saying, don't take any wife from the stock. Okay, now we're not talking about the land they live in. Mm -hmm. From the stock of Canaan. Mm -hmm. You remember who Canaan was? Do you remember how God cursed Canaan? Yeah. Remember that? Anybody coming from Canaan, don't marry. Don't marry them. He had said, cursed be Canaan. Don't, don't, don't marry anyone that traced their lineage back to Canaan. Now we have, there's only two exceptions to this rule, and that is a Rahab a harlot and Ruth a Moabitess. They're in Christ's genealogy. But they both converted. Yeah. Uh -huh. They both embraced the God of the Jews. Yeah. Which qualified them. Now when the law was given, God brought this matter up again. He said, Neither, speaking of the heathen, destroy the heathen, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy. Maybe we ought not to read that. That's a little too tough, huh? <laughs> Huh? Yeah, right. Don't show mercy to them. Uh -huh. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Yeah. Thy daughter shalt thou not give to their son, and his daughter shalt thou now take unto thy son. Why not? He said, they'll turn your way. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <clears throat> you remember when uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, the Jews had intermingled in the marriage. At, that's after the Babylonian captivity. And some of the Jews couldn't speak the Jews' language anymore. They got, uh, they, half the language is Ashdod, remember, and half the Jews. So they, they couldn't speak the Jews' language. They just, the intermarriage had caused a lot of trouble. And Nehemiah, 
<laughs> he really got angry. He pulled out some of their beards. Yeah. He said, don't you know what happened to Solomon? You do know what happened to Solomon, don't you? The older he got, the dumber he got. Ended up building places to worship idols because he married other women. And the scripture says God was angry with Solomon for he appeared to him two times. Why did Solomon degenerate? He married these heathen women. You've probably seen it happen. I tell you, brethren, that uh, Paul taught, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, and he was talking about marriage. Don't. I know. Sometimes people say, well, I'll convert them, I'll marry them, and then I'll work with them. And do not be unequally yoked. Some people end up with an unequal yoke because they, they didn't choose to do that. They, they were converted after they were married, and one was converted and one wasn't, and they got, they got some real problems, they could tell you. I tell you, believing parents should commence teaching their children this right away. As soon as they can understand anything, you drum this into them. Don't marry people from the world. And even then, you'll have some disappointments. They won't all, we're not going to pretend here. Sticky thing with God. God, one time, speaking through Paul, dealt with widows. Some of the widows weren't sure whether they could marry again or not. And uh, he said, no, you can marry, if your husband's dead, you can marry, but only in the Lord. Yeah, that's right. Don't take a wife. I know there's not many wives available, some, but don't take a wife for the Canaanites. I want you to go to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, Take a wife from thence from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now, by this time, as we understand, Bethel probably had passed away. And Laban, her brother. I don't know if you thought about this or not, but at this juncture in time, there weren't many relatives to pick from. <laughs> Abraham only had one living brother. That's Nahor. Haran died, remember? He'd, Haran died back in the, when, they, when they started out. So I only had one person that could generate seed. None of Abraham's other children, which include Ishmael, Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Zishbak, and Shua, he had seven other children. Couldn't take a wife from them. I'm pointing out here now that there weren't a lot of people to choose from. In fact, four or five hundred years later, No, it wasn't four or five hundred, but it was about three hundred years later. When Joseph called for Jacob, they came down, and all of the offspring of Jacob came down. They were seventy souls. Yeah, yeah. Amen. That's quite a while after the mm -hmm. after the text. So I'm saying there weren't many people to choose from, but that didn't reduce the requirement. Now that didn't reduce it. I know, young ladies. I know. That it's hard to find some a man, mm -hmm. boyfriend, someone to marry. Mm -hmm. I know it. But you've got to be willing to hunt. Amen. Right. Not to make a wrong choice. Amen. We got people can tell you making a wrong choice in this matter. Well, what it could yeah. be, breathe havoc for you. Uh -huh. See what I'm saying is you're not facing anything that he didn't face. In fact, it was harder, it was harder for Jacob to find a wife than for you. Mm -hmm. And he had to travel six to seven hundred miles to even find a family that qualified. <laughs> well, I thank God that this is in the this is in the text. See, when God directs, go ahead. No, this is a serious matter because this is how Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block. That's right. Remember, he, Balak wanted him to curse Israel, but he couldn't. Yeah. yeah. But this was a way that he could get. Yeah. These people, mm -hmm. to be unfavorable in God's sight, is to intermarry with heathen women. Yeah, oh amen. See, faith always obeys, even when it's hard. Mm -hmm. God called Abram to Ur, from Ur of the Chaldees mm -hmm. to Canaan. That was 1,500 miles by foot and camelback. 
toting along all your possessions. Yeah. Hmm? Was that easy? Never has been easy to obey God. Mm -hmm. yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. Never has been. Amen. <laughs> so what we have in these texts is that when God directs, faith always follows. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Faith is never recalcitrant, yeah. disobedient, or drawback. That's unbelief that does that, not faith. Now he says to him, and God Almighty bless thee. <laughs> God Almighty. That's the, that's the fourth time now that Isaac's blessed Jacob. That's the fourth mm -hmm. time. <laughs> Almighty God. Mm -hmm. Some other verses read, the ruler of all. El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. God all-sufficient. The sovereign God. The all-powerful God. The strong God. Mm -hmm. Almighty, that never applies to an angel mm -hmm. yeah. or a cherubim or a seraphim or an archangel. Mm -hmm. That only and always applies to God. Mm -hmm. No created personality is ever said to be almighty. Yeah. Amen. It's applied to God the Father. The apostles do this. You will be my father unto I will you will be a father unto I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He says. It's applied to the glorified Christ. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which was and is, is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Yeah. It's applied to the one that sat on the heavenly throne. Mm -hmm. When you see it was the Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. By the Lord God, Revelation eleven seventeen, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And it's applied to the living God as they sang a song to him, the Lord God Almighty. It's applied to the God of wrath. Mm -hmm. He will tread out the fierceness of the of the, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty. God. That, that's a, that's a, uh, in the old scriptures, Almighty was, there was no commentary on what that meant. Now I'm going to show you in the New Covenant, he takes that same phrase, Almighty, and he elaborates. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's more involvement with God now. Yeah. He can speak more, more about this. Think about possibilities. With God, all things are possible. See, I like that, that, that wasn't stated back then. Yeah. It was demonstrated, but it wasn't stated. How about this? Colossians 1.29, I also labor striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Oh, see, that wasn't talk like that. Wasn't back there. Here's another one. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you might know what is the hope of your calling and the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Oh. See how see the difference in Amen. the way he talks of the new covenant? Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask you think according to the power that worketh in us. See how different that is? All right, we're introduced to the Almighty back there. But you really don't have a very clear idea of what Almighty means till you get over here mm -hmm. in the apostolic writings. Yeah. Then it's opened up. So he saw the hem of the garment, you might mm -hmm. say. May the Lord God Almighty make thee fruitful. Make! Make thee fruitful. The other versions say, give you fruit or make you to increase or give you many children. Now this is speaking of their fleshly posterity. That's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Fruitful meant have more flesh and blood children. Yeah. That's what it meant. Now this kind of blessing foresaw several things. One, the time when in this, when in Egypt they would multiply. Yeah, they hadn't. Sometime later they hadn't multiplied to that extent when Jacob went down into Egypt. Uh, but yeah. see, but when the time came, yeah, this right. blessing was fulfilled in God's time. They began to yeah. multiply. Uh -huh. Forgiven. Yes. Before we move too far away from this God Almighty, I'd like to 
point this out that God being almighty can either work for you or yeah, against, or against you. you. That's right. Because either it, the fact that God is almighty mm -hmm. means that it's not going to go well for the goats, the chaff, it's not going to go well for them in that day. So you can either store up incredible wrath or by him all things created. That's a he, he's good to have on your side. So Amen. God, God being almighty is a plus for us. Amen. Amen. God also to multiply thee, more fleshly offspring, had in mind the occupation of the promised land. Now I told him when they went into the promised land, he was going to drive them out, drive the enemy out, little by little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, he said, there's not enough numbers to fill up the land. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I drive all of them out, the beast will multiply and you'll have trouble with that. Mm -hmm. See? So this multiply, it has to do with that, see? With there being enough people to fill up the land. Well, I'm telling you, God's reserved a lot of good things for His people. Amen. But uh, we could do with some more. Hmm? The Lord multiplied disciples in Acts. The disciples were multiplied. That's right. That's not one by one by one. That's not. About, we're talking about multiplying, not one by one by one. Yeah. Had to do with. God foreseeing when he's going to lift the veil from Israel's eyes. Well, it wasn't going to be like a handful of people. <laughs> Not this time around. When he lifts the veil, it's going to shake the whole world. It'll be like a rising from the dead. Life from the dead. See, you've got to have a lot of people for that to happen. When all Israel will be saved, all Israel shall be saved for the deliverers shall come out of Zion and turn to end godliness from Jacob, and I'm gonna I'm gonna multiply so that's gonna happen to a lot of people. Amen. Where things are heating up over there, we may be drawing we right. maybe getting close to something here. Mm -hmm. When the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Mm -hmm. Now this is where the new covenant is unique. Unique to the covenant made with Noah, unique to the covenant of prosperity made to Abraham. <laughs> In Christ, a different kind of fruitfulness takes place. Yeah. John the Baptist spoke of the axe being laid to the root of the trees of the Israelites because they didn't bring forth good fruit. So there's another kind of people. Mm -hmm. See, a mega church doesn't impress God. That's right. It made men. It doesn't impress God. Mm -hmm. Not in this day, great day of salvation. Every tree that's not bearing fruit is going to be cut down. That's yeah. what Jesus said. So, everybody be duly warned. Mm -hmm. No fruit, your tree is cut down. Yeah. It's, yeah. Whether it's a person or a church, mm -hmm. like Sardis, mm -hmm. Laodicea, mm -hmm. Pergamos, God told him, look, I'm going to come and fight against you. Mm -hmm. You don't repent over that, I'm going to fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Mm -hmm. By Ephesus, I'll take away your candlestick. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. See, there's a different kind of fruit. But in our day, things have been so corrupted that people equate a lot of people or nice people. or They equate that with, with God multiplying the people. But that's... That may not be the case at all. Brother, you remember when Jesus said, every plant that my father hath not planted <laughs> up. shall be rooted up. <laughs> now notice too how the, how the offspring of Christ, how the reference is made to them. They're called uh, sons of God. Those who are begotten of God. See, this, was, this wasn't said those days back there. Household of God, Christ's house, the whole family in heaven and earth. See, none of these suggest that you can have a fleshly tie association with God. Yeah. Uh -huh. Abraham could. Uh -huh. Isaac could. Jacob could. Israel could. But it wasn't, with Israel particularly, it wasn't the best association because they had these repeated rebukes and rebuffs and taken captive by other nations and plagues and all because they didn't shape up. But let me tell you, 
This is not what God intends in the church. This is not what God intends. A fledgling church has got to be beat up all the time. This is not what God intends in Christ Jesus. In these days of media ministers who promote the Jewish roots, that's a big thing. I never thought I'd live to see something like this, but they promote, they're reestablishing re re Jewish feast days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, if you listen to any of these, any of these religious media, they're, yeah. we're in the middle of one right now. Mm -hmm. Feast of Tabernacles. They, they are reinstituting the Jewish feasts and there's a Jewish roots movement in the Christian world that's grown by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. But this is not. They hold out the Deuteronomy 28 as applying to the people of God today. You'll be blessed when you go out, blessed you come in, you'll be the head and not the tail and so forth. But I've noticed that these uh, babblers, they can leave out the stipulations. Yeah, right. Like God said, it should come to pass, if thou, if, if, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and then the blessings begin. But do you think that's going to happen? Happen? For people that don't obey God and don't respond to him? See, but that's being presented in that way. Amen. Again, God said, the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and do them, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words that I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods. Well, they didn't do that, and so they didn't get these blessings. And you won't either. That's just the way it is. That was the nature of the old covenant, yeah. though. It was, a, it was a fleshly covenant. It was a, it was a bilateral covenant. God would do this if you did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the covenant. Yeah. And Israel didn't do that, so they broke the covenant. Yeah. But this is not the kind of covenant that's given in Christ. Amen. Here Christ, God makes a new people uh -huh. <laughs> that will walk in his judgments and do his ways. With the single exception of all bless, all families of the earth being blessed, with the exception of that, God never promised Abraham any blessing that wasn't fleshly. I mean, search the record and see it: land and people. That was all He was promised. That's not all you're promised. Not at all. Now, in the covenant we're under. God puts his laws into the mind of the people and writes them on their minds. The people will be God's unique, will be in God's unique way. They'll walk in his way. There'll be no need to teach the constituents of the covenant to know God. Everybody will know him. Everyone in the covenant will know him, from the least to the greatest. God will be merciful to their unrighteousness. It says, sins and iniquities will remember no more. That's not what's said of Israel. All through the prophets, God is remembering their sin. How he, you tempted me those seven times. You departed from me. See, he always brought their sins up. Yeah, that's right. Their past sins, he brought them up again. He doesn't do that in Christ. Amen. He's I remember their sin no more. That's See, it's right. a different kind of different kind of covenant. <laughs> well, I could say more on that subject, but I'm gonna pass pass along. Mm -hmm. Says I'm I'm gonna give you Jacob the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham. Take a blessing given to Abraham, and I'm gonna take that blessing, I'm gonna give it to you. Yeah. What? See, that's very unique, very unique thing. God's acquainting you now with a divine manner here. God can do this. God can take something that was given to somebody else and to give it to you. Yes, amen. <laughs> well, you already know where I'm going to this. That's what yeah. he did with Christ. Yeah, right. He takes what he gives to Christ and he gives it to you. Yeah, that's right. But he's teaching people that this is his way. Mm -hmm. This is how he chose to resolve the sin dilemma. Yeah. Yes. You couldn't so resolve the sin dilemma by telling people what they should do. He was pretty detailed in telling them what they should do, but they couldn't do it, didn't resolve anything. Yeah. So he recreates the people, makes them after his own image and after his own likeness and the true holiness. 
and then they want to follow him and he blesses them by preparing them to be forever with him. Amen. It's a different kind. Different kind of covenant. <laughs> the blessing of Abraham. Let's, let's just recap it briefly. Uh -huh. I'll make thee a great nation. I'll bless thee and make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. I'll bless him that bless thee. I'll curse him that curse thee. And these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Thy seed shall be as numerous as the stars of heaven. I'll make thee exceeding fruitful. I'll make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. I'll establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. I will be a God unto thee and to thy seed. I'll give unto thee and thy seed the land of Canaan. I, in blessing I'll bless thee. and multiply I'll multiply thee. Thy seed shall possess the gate of the enemies. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That's a staggering blessing for one man. I don't mind telling you. But did you notice that almost all had to do with earth? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did you see that? Uh -huh. Almost all had to do with earth. Well, actually, it did all have to do with earth. Even the, even the promised seed, blessed, yeah. had to do with earth life. They're vastly inferior to the ones we receive in Christ, but they introduce us yeah, that's right. to how God blesses. Amen. See, Amen. It's on the basis of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he says that thou mayest inherit the land, mm -hmm. uh, wherein you're a stranger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Abraham was too. Abraham never had a plot of land big enough to put his foot on. Mm -hmm. as, what, as what Stephen said, he, he never had a piece of land big enough to put his foot on. Only he bought a cave to bury the dead in. Mm -hmm. That's it. So here's Abraham. He's promised the land, never got it while he was here. Mm -hmm. Here's Isaac, he's promised the land. He's still at this age, he's about 137 years old at this time. He still hadn't got the land. And Jacob, he's a stranger in the land, but they're still talking about the promise, even though none of them have really realized yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They're still talking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. we admit we're not in heaven yet. We admit it, but we're, we're planning on it. We're planning on it. We talk about it. We talk about an eternal inheritance. We admit we haven't don't have it now. Yeah, yeah. Amen. There's a sense in which we're strangers, you know, but we talk about it. Mm -hmm. God gave it. Uh, he gave this land to Abram. He gave it to him. And I give you the text where he promised, I'm going to give you the land. But, he never, but experientially, while he's in the earth, he never got it. Yeah. Now, see, the, a lot of people would have trouble with that. They said God didn't carry through. He said He's going to have it. Ah, but there's the world to come. Yeah, amen. Amen. <laughs> there's the world to come where there'll be a new earth. Mm -hmm. ah. And the earth's going to be uh, regenerated. In fact, it's called the regeneration. Yeah, and then you'll have it. It's delightful, you know, to see that the, these brothers never forgot who they were. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. That's what, the, that's what the people of faith have Amen. in common. One thing, they know they're sojourners mm -hmm. and strangers. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. Now I have a little chartology here, of course, for you. That Here's how God works. He gives people things by promise. Mm -hmm. See? <laughs> now only God can do this. He can give it to you yeah. by promise because yeah. God can't lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if he says he's going to do it, just he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. He gives it. So he gave it to Abraham by promise, not by actual position, by promise. Mm -hmm. And then Isaac, uh, Abraham gave it to Isaac by promise. Mm -hmm. And Isaac now gives it to Jacob by promise. Mm -hmm. Now this doesn't rank high among men. He said, a bird in the hand is worth two in a bush, you know. Give me my pie in the sky by and by. I don't want that. Give it to me now, see. But uh, that's not how God works. He gives it by promise. Mm -hmm. And only those who are willing to wait that's right. get it. Yeah. Only those who live by hope and faith, only, only they're going to get it. And this will glorify God. Because in the end, you'll see, God didn't lie and promise crown of righteousness, an everlasting life and reign with Christ, so forth. God's telling the truth when he promises that, but see, Amen. he's designed it, so you just have to, you have to wait while you're in the world. Yeah. Amen. When a person lives by faith, he's driven by hope, not by sight. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So Isaac sent away Jacob, sent him away, now, God didn't tell him to send Jacob away. I want to make a point of this. God didn't, God didn't apparently didn't tell Jacob, no. 
uh, Isaac, t tell Isaac, tell Jacob not to marry a Canaanite woman. And, and tell Jacob, you and Rebekah, be sure and tell Jacob to go to the house of Laban. He didn't, there's no record he told him that. This was what I call a sanctified conclusion. They knew what God had said in thy seed, thy seed, thy seed. He kept hammering that home. Thy seed, thy seed, thy seed. They knew that the Abraham was unique from everybody else because God picked him out of the cauldron. And so they knew. Uh, they concluded, we can't be cross Marian. Admittedly, Case of Isaac, it appears as though there's only one woman in the whole world that was ready for him. That's why Abraham's servant prayed, Show me the woman. Yeah, that's right. Apparently, Rebecca was it. Mm -hmm. And Laban, he's going to have this multiple choice now. So it, uh, it's advanced some more. But you see, he held on to the promise. They, they concluded, We can't. Can't intermarry because that that'll mess up this seed thing. Yeah. Do you know? I know that a lot of Christians they cannot draw a sound conclusion. You, if you give them fact A, B, C, they can't mm -hmm. come up with a reasonable conclusion to the matter. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, but they could mm -hmm. conclusion. So he sent him away, and so he went to. Padanaram. You notice how particular they are, and they spell it out. It's a particular place, Padanaram, mm -hmm. the dwelling of a particular person, Laban, the son of Bethuel. Mm -hmm. The father of Laban is a peculiar, particular person, Bethuel, the Syrian. The identity of Laban was specific, the brother of Rebekah. The identity of the sister of Laban was specific, Rebekah. Jacob and Esau's mother. <laughs> See how specific all that is? Oh, how we need uh, godly reasoning. There's a total absence of generalities. You see that? There are no generalities. Just do the best you can. Keep your eyes open along the way. Uh, you, you just keep on going until you get to this place. Yeah. See, some people start looking too soon. They do. They start looking too soon. For the things that please God, for the things they should do, they're looking too soon. You've got to get to a certain place where God can talk to you and where you're sensitive to the will of God, where the surroundings are conducive to doing the right thing. A lot of people, I'm convinced, try and please God. They don't have enough information. <laughs> they're not in a place where they can do that yet. They've got to keep on move and isolate themselves from the world in their heart. We're talking about in your heart. Mm -hmm. Cut off from the world. Well, that is pleasing to God as you're continuing to grow and to, That's right. to move in that direction. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, again, there's this thing of obedience. Here it is again. Abraham's called to go out early. He did. Command to walk to the land. He did. Command to circumcise all the males in his house. He did. Command to cast out Hagar. And Ishmael. only did. Command to offer Isaac and set out to do it immediately. When Isaac was commanded to go down to, not to go down to Egypt, he obeyed. When Isaac was commanded to remain in the land, he obeyed. Now when Jacob's commanded to go to the house of Laban, he obeys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are the kind of people God works among. Amen. We should not expect grandiose divine workings where this thing of obedience is lacking. Mm -hmm. Obedience is a manner of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm going to bring up Esau again. Mm -hmm. Esau is privy to all this that just happened. He saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pat Anaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. All right, now how does a Esauite act when he hears something like that? Uh -huh. Now we're gonna see how he acts. He 
Jesus spoke of people seeing what you do. Mm -hmm. Esau saw what was done to Jacob, what was the blessing, but he, he saw it. Jesus said that men may see your good works. Believing husbands are told, uh, believe, unbelieving husbands beholding the chaste man of the wife of their believing wives and said that they may, may be one without the word. That's right. Those who speak evil of the saints beholding their good manner of life will be ashamed. Mature people beholding the manner in which young believers conduct their lives. You don't let no man despise your youth. Mm -hmm. uh, young people, you don't have to be stupid. You don't have to be dumb. That's right. Let the, let the worldly people be dumb. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Don't let anyone despise your youth. Don't say, well, they're young. What, what do you expect? They're young. Oh, say, praise God. Look, they're young, but look what they've done for God. Look how they're serving the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. <laughs> Esau saw it <clears throat> and saw how he'd been blessed, his father blessed him, mm -hmm. and that Jacob obeyed his father. So how are you going to react now to this thing about not marrying a Canaanite woman? Because Esau had married two Canaanite women, right? Yeah. He'd married two Canaanite women. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. You mean he didn't see this until then? Well, apparently not. You remember when he married those two women? It says they grieved both Isaac and Rebekah. So some years before, and he married these women some 30 years before, they upset Isaac and Rebekah. He married them, but he, did, he was uh, he had, uh, dumb like an ox or like an ostrich. And so he didn't pick up on this till now. He didn't note things unless they directly impacted on him. Now you yeah. probably, <laughs> that's, that's how people in the flesh are. Things don't bother them until it's like a thorn, and then all of a sudden they're concerned. That's the nature of flesh. Mm -hmm. Because the, the carnal mind's enmity against God. It, it, it can't, that's right. Amen. can't think straight. It can't take note of divine warning signals. So, Esau, what are you going to do? Well, uh, my father has another son. Abraham has another son. I mean, Abraham, he has a son. Ishmael, that, that ought to qualify. Huh? He's a seed of Abraham, Ishmael. And he was blessed too. God said he blessed Ishmael. So I, he, did, he didn't go to Laban's house, but to Ishmael. <laughs> The Ishmael's house. That's the manner of flesh. A gravitate to a system of law. Well, this, look, yeah. this is going to qualify because Ishmael is the son of Abraham. Mm -hmm. He's called Ishmael, the son of Abraham. That's how he's described. Mm -hmm. And so they, that ought to qualify. Mm -hmm. See, the progenitor stands for the progeny. If Esau is profane, the progeny is profane. Mm -hmm. When it comes to salvation, the same rules applied. Jesus is counted with all his seed. Mm -hmm. Behold, I and the children. Behold, I and the children. Thou hast given me. Jesus stands with his people together. Yeah. They're not, there's no wedge, wedge between them. Now the woman Esau took to be his wife was Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. See, there it is. Mm -hmm. She was also called Bashermath and Genesis 36.3. And eventually she gave birth to Ruel, whose sons were all dukes or chiefs. That's the mindset of the flesh. This ought to qualify. Surely ought to qualify. I'm sure that's what it, I'm sure that's why this is here, to tell us that Ishmael thought that would be a good substitute for the Canaanite woman. I'll, I'll marry. Edomite women. There you are. Mm -hmm. That'll resolve it. So God didn't say don't marry an Edomite. He uh -huh. said don't marry a Canaanite. So there. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's how flesh thinks now. Yeah. He didn't say you couldn't drink at all. 
He just said, don't get drunk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you got to read, read a, bit, a little bit more about the Word of God. You'll find there's considerably more on the subject than that. But I'm showing you how flesh thinks. Yeah. Takes these shortcuts. Amen. But the carnal mind is enmity against God because it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Yeah. Amen. So Esau couldn't think right. Mm -hmm. It isn't that he didn't think right. He couldn't think right. Amen. Now this will solve a lot of problems for you. It will. You find people, you've labored with them, you talk to them, you, you, they just don't get it, or maybe they can't get it. Maybe that's it. Just as surely, Paul said, they that live after the flesh shall die. That's just as sure as if you eat that fruit of the tree, you'll die. That's just as sure as that. Just that sure. Amen. To this very day, there remain people like Esau who imagine they can please God by doing something that looks religious. Yeah. You think that'll please God. I'll draw this to a conclusion now. See, acceptance by God requires separation from the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. In Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's day, that was don't marry the Canaanite women. Yeah. Yeah. It was that was that way. Now, commencing with the twelfth chapter of Genesis. We're exposed to how God's working out his eternal purpose. I got a focuses in on that project because a lot of preparations had to be done before Jesus came. For instance, on a physical scale, an orderly and governed environment had to be created in which all this could take place where Satan wouldn't be given the upper hand. So in the beginning he created the heavens and the earth and gives you extensive detail about how it was created very orderly so it was very orderly and run smoothly because for God to work out his purpose he did, chose not to work it in moral chaos mm -hmm. that was going on. It had to be an orderly stage so to speak. And he, he, he set in motion certain divisions that would have to last. He separated the light from the darkness and what's above from what's beneath and he set in the stage, see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and he established that sin is in no way acceptable the first, first time Adam and Eve, who were morally innocent, mm -hmm. the only morally perfect man and woman that ever lived, yeah, right. Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. right. The only morally perfect man, adult, mm -hmm. adult man and woman that lived. <laughs> one sin, one time, out. Yeah. That's right. What's he saying? Sin's not allowed in my presence. Mm -hmm. No, you can't come back in the garden. I've assigned this cherubim over here to keep the way of the tree of the life. You can't get back in. That's God. This is God. I'm going to have to start over. I'm going to have to have a new race. Because nobody from this race is going to get in. And Adam all die, see. And hope was established by a line of... Following the devastating fall of Eden, just a, just a word was said. It wasn't even said to Adam and Eve. It was said to Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, you, the head of the, the seed of the woman shall bruise your head. You'll bruise his heel. But listen, they hung on to that. Yeah. That's all they had. Mm -hmm. Till Abraham, that is all the human race had. Mm -hmm. They hung on. <laughs> they hung on to it, and God carried them through. Now, when he said something about seed to Abraham, I think he oh, yeah. made the connection with that seed back there that God mentioned. Mm -hmm. And he established uh, that one person can stand for many. Mm -hmm. See, everyone, does, everyone is not like on their own two legs and that's it. Oh, it's not that, it's not that simple. One can stand for many. Good thing. Yes. Because Adam stood for all his race. When he died, everybody died. When he was judged, everybody was judged. When he was condemned, everybody was condemned. When he sinned, everybody was, quote, made sinners. That's yeah, what's, right. what it says. Uh -huh. Now, see, all that's setting us up for another yes, 
second man yeah. Amen. and the last Adam. Yeah. And he's going to come along and he's, he's going to bless the people because of him. Uh -huh. And many are going to be made righteous. Uh, he's preparing for that. Uh -huh. you know, see what God had to go through to prepare people for that. He had to establish a priority of grace. So he just took one, one occasion, one man, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and in this global destruction mm -hmm. for a staggering number of people. I've read people who have tried to estimate how many people were alive. I was very displeased with how they thought. Mm -hmm. I shared with you this already. I want to mention it again. But if the human race doubled every year, Commencing with Adam. If the human race doubled once a year by the time of the flood, you just have to go calculate that equals a trillion people. Mm -hmm. hmm? Obviously, a lot of people died, but I'm making the point poof, staggering number of people died in the flood. Yeah. Billions. Every one, of, every one of any scholarship maintains it was infinitely more than, than they live now. Because the earth wasn't majority water, it was all land, there's lush vegetation. One man. And his family was saved because of him. That's right. There's no reference to Mrs. Noah's faith. Mm -hmm. We find out later that they did believe, but they were. Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. It was Amen. one person blessed mm -hmm. the whole human race in his case. Yeah. <laughs> when, they, when the flood went down, the whole human race well. consisted of eight people. Mm -hmm. Well, that grew. It only consisted of two the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You already quadrupled it. To this point in the book of Genesis, God is developing a people who are God conscious. Now, it's, he gave Cain, for instance, an opportunity to be God conscious. Mm -hmm. Remember? That's right. Cain was really upset because God accepted Abel and his offering, but rejected his. God said, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Mm -hmm. yeah. You'll be accepted. You do, but he, Cain, he's like the flesh. You can't, you can tell him something good. He doesn't mm -hmm. receive it. But there were people here and there. In the days of Enos, that was Seth's son. They begin to call on the name of the Lord. A sensitivity gradually begin to develop. A sensitivity to God. By the time of Abraham, it really, Abraham was really. God never had to talk to call him twice, except when he was going to sacrifice his son. Then he, then his name's called Abraham. Abraham. Yeah. A good thing in between the Abrahams, he'd have killed him if he wasn't sensitive. Yeah. So he's developing people sensitive to him, so he can work to them through calling. He can direct them. He can give them promises. And they'll maintain their life. Just holding on to that promise. Now, brethren, he's given us a lot, a lot of promises. Mm -hmm. They shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Huh? Uh -huh. You'll judge the world. you judge angels. Oh, there's a lot of wonderful things. They'll go in and out and find pasture. Where I'm bringing it, there's not going to be any of this stuff. Sin and darkness, nothing defiling going to enter. Amen. If you hang on to that promise, you'll make it. Uh -huh. You'll make it. That's right. You'll finish. You, how do I know it? Because we've got these patriarchs. Amen. As an example, all they had was a, a promise, and it wasn't anything like the one you got. Uh -huh. They held on to it. Amen. Hundreds of years, centuries later, when Jacob dies, he never did get the piece of property. He said, when I die, bury me yeah. in that cave of Machpelah with Abraham and Sarah. Bury me in the promised land. Some years passed, and Joseph found out he's going to die. He told her, listen, you're going to be delivered. You're going to be, God's going to visit you and take you out of this land. He said, when you go, pick up my bones. Mm -hmm. And Moses picked the scripture says Moses picked them up. Yeah. And somebody toted those bones for 40 years. Yes, amen. And they buried them in the wood. Right. <laughs> what caused that? 
That's, that's the potency of hope, brother. That's the potency of it. If you hang on to the... See, we, we, we could talk more about the promises, I'm convinced. We're learning to speak more of them. Yes. But this is what will enable you to be an overcomer. Amen. You hear what God's promised, the good things He's promised. And He can't lie. Yeah. Yes, we'll tell you that most of them we don't we haven't mm -hmm. we haven't experienced them yet. We're like we have to buy a little parcel to live in once in a while. But you're gonna inherit it. Yes. And I urge you to be strong in faith now. Don't give up. Don't throw in the sponge. God's called you to something better than he called Abraham to. It wasn't because Abraham was deficient. It's because that's all Abraham could receive. That was at that time there just wasn't a lot known. He couldn't talk about heavenly things to Abraham. They hadn't been revealed yet, brother. But now they have been revealed. They have been revealed now. And as you ponder them and think upon them, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. Mm -hmm. You'll be an overcomer. Amen. Whatever attacks your faith, that's your enemy. Fight it. Amen. Amen. Fight it, whatever it is. Feelings be hanged. Mm -hmm. Not going to let anyone damage my faith and hope or take yes. it from Amen. me. Uh -huh. Sometimes God will make a short work. He'll just be resolved kind of suddenly, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> Other times you may have to engaged in a long warfare. Like they driving the Canaanites out of Canaan. Some of them took them years to do it. Some of them never did get it done. Never did, never did drive them out. I'll stop there. And if you want to add something, you know, I've been kind of quiet tonight. Yeah, I was uh, impressed with the carefulness with which God represents Jacob. His yeah. integrity. Yeah, and he know. never, never um, imputes him with the words that modern men do. They, they speak ill of Jacob, but God never does. God says, I have not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> so this, uh, this record that he's given us, is, it's a pure record, and it says, state things the way they really are. The way mm -hmm. that he, Isaac blessed Jacob. Now this was, like you may just this point. Even after the fact that, that he had obtained a blessing, which was, he says, by deception, but he, he saw it. He saw That's it right. for what it was, and so he he blessed Jacob, and we should too. Yes, Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. I just want to say we. I mean, we we are to be of good courage because see, they saw the promises afar a off, far off, and yeah. and embraced them. Mm -hmm. See, but for us, the promises aren't a far off. That's right. You know, I, I like you made that connection between Abraham thinking about the promise concerning the seed and the seed that was mentioned in Genesis 3 yeah. because yeah. that that is them seeing yeah. the promise yeah. afar off. Here Abraham is 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 sensing this yeah. near one that was going to come. He knew he wasn't it. You know, by faith you can see he wasn't it. Yeah. But the very fact that he didn't receive the promise of the land or tell him there was more to this promise yeah. than Abraham. But so, yeah. so Jesus says he's he saw my day and was glad. Yeah. Now, that's seeing a far off, and yet he could get a hold of it. Yeah. yeah. For us. You know, these brethren weren't told anything about Satan either. Have you ever uh -huh. thought about that? Yeah. Yeah. Adam and Eve in a face-to-face -face confrontation with the old servant, but you won't find any teaching about the devil yeah. until you get up into the prophets. Uh -huh. or, the, or the law. And the law that said they worship demons, they offered sacrifice, but uh -huh. that's like 2,500 years from the creation. Yeah. So they didn't have a lot of tutelage about the devil. I can see why. It would probably would have scared them, mm -hmm. frightened them, because their faith had to be built up. They had to, they had to see God for who He was and have this strong reliance upon God before you ever start talking about the enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got, you've got to be convinced of the greatness of God, the Almighty. Yes, Amen. Yeah. Yes, it's Tasha. Um, this point that you made on the detailed nature of this account that how detailed um, uh, Isaac and Rebecca were in telling Jacob where to go yes where to go and the Lord has done this with us as well Amen. He's, he's very detailed in telling us where to go and and um, I'm grateful that I feel like I'm just kind of on the edge of this but seeing that salvation is not simplistic at all. It's not simple. It's very detailed. 
It's very, it's very intricate, yeah. and the Lord designed it that way. Yeah. He made it that way, and I'm grateful that, that we have these accounts of these brethren, um, that we love them, and we see, oh, amen. we see how they were able to endure under very harsh circumstances, but the Lord, the Lord brought them through in a mm -hmm. detailed manner. <laughs> you remember Jesus said, you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Yeah. What a thought. That was his enemies. Think about us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He might say, well, yeah, I beheld you. I beheld you. I was one of the cloud of witnesses up there yeah. watching you run the race. Uh -huh. Anyone else tonight? Yeah, Sister Logan. I like this point of how you made of how we are people living by faith yet a promise of this inheritance and I like also the thought of how it, God's not just waving this in front of our faces we yeah. are also tasting a fruit first fruits Amen. of this promise Amen. that is helping us continue to endure to the end so that we can fully obtain this promise yes I was thinking about this potency of faith of uh, how important it is to believe yeah. you know somebody if 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 I was to tell you I promise you something and I'm able to give it to you mm -hmm. and then you get that promise then once you receive it it's kind of like n not much of anything mm -hmm. anymore but but these promises of God I mean yeah, these promises are so that potent yeah. that they'll carry you all through your life that you can make your whole life will change because you believe the promises That's of right. God That's you right. just, you'll shape your whole life around That's and you'll right. live your life like that all the way through That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good preaching. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for their record. And they have demonstrated for us the potency of your of faith and the effectiveness of your choices. Now, Father, we have read that you, we are to walk in the steps of the our of the faith of our father Abraham and we consent to do this we want to do this we want to walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham and whenever you we know that you have said something or required something we just do it right away and never never to be retarded in our responses we repent of any retardation that we've had and we confess to you this is not what we want we want to be instant Amen. in our responses to Thee. We thank You for the example that You've set before us. It's given us hope that this can be done. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.